welcome to our recording. Today what we're going to be recording is our seventh grade lesson that we do on our nature trails. Um, but before we get into that, let's talk about the solid waste authority of Palm Beach County. So, um, hi again, my name is Dawn Perez. I'm one of the education specialists at the Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach County in West Palm Beach, Florida. And we are a local government agency that was created in 1975 to manage all of Palm Beach County's waste. That would include your garbage, your recycling, your biosolids, and your home chemicals. Okay, um, we are a very large county. We are the third largest population wise in Florida. We have about 1.4 million people that live in Palm Beach County. And on average, each one of us creates about 12 pounds of solid waste. So if we do that math, if we take that 1.4 million people and multiply it by 12 pounds, at the Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach County, we get almost 17 million pounds of waste per day. So um, we handle that in many different ways. We have our recovery materials processing facility where we um, separate everything for you while you're recyclable, sort them even further, and then sell them to companies that recycle it into something new. We actually take your garbage here in Palm Beach County and burn it and turn it into electricity. Um, but today what we're gonna be focusing on is our nature trails. So a lot of the times when you hear recycling garbage, you might not think about nature trails, right? It doesn't really come to mind. But here at the Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach County, we have about five miles of trails. And here is our map of our nature trails. So back in the 80s, we were looking to build our landfills. And so we had this area surveyed by wildlife agencies. And when they surveyed this area, they found an endangered species of bird called a snail kite. Uh, we didn't want to kick the snail kite out of its home, right? So what we decided to do was move our landfill somewhere else and turn this area that I'm pointing at into a conservation area. So we now have about 300 acres of conservation area and about five miles of trails that are open to the public from sunrise to sunset. So you'll see on our map, we have our butterfly loop we have our e-loop, we have our dragonfly, and we have our rookery. Now, yes, we do have a rookery, which is an area that is protected for birds that nest, birds nest there, okay? Um, and the reason we have our rookery is we have snail kites, like this guy here, okay, that roost at night there. And snail kites look like this. This is the male, it's darker. And this is the female, which is more mottled and lighter. And we also have our threatened wood storks that use our rookery to nest. So these are our threatened wood storks here. And plenty of our other birds use our rookery too, like our roseate spoonbill, okay, and our anhingas. But our, our wood storks and our snail kites, which are threatened and endangered, are the reasons why we have our trails and our rookery and our conservation area. Today, what we're going to be focusing on is adaptations and some of the birds that use and inhabit our trail system. But before we go into the lesson, I did want to review some vocabulary words. So I'm sure you guys have heard of this, but symbiosis or a symbiotic relationship, right? Um, that's a relationship between two or more different species, different animals or plants that live together and they may depend on each other for survival, okay? Some species have special adaptations that are part of this relationship, and there are positive and negative symbiotic relationships, okay? And we're gonna go into the different kinds of symbiotic relationships in a second. So one type of symbiotic relationship is mutualism. And this is when two species benefit each other, okay? Um, and it's a very common type of symbiosis. So um, an example of mutualism, if you guys have ever heard of lichen, which I don't have an example right now, but lichen, which grows on trees, sometimes they're like greenish or reddish little spots on trees. Lichen is actually a mutualistic relationship between a bacteria, a fungi, and an algae, okay? So the fungi provides, um, the, sorry, the algae with a home, with a place to live, and the algae provides the fungi with food, okay, because it photosynthesizes like other plants. 
And then sometimes berry bacteria lives in there. We like to say that Freddy fungus and Alice algae took a lichen to each other, okay? And um, so again, lichen is made out of algae and fungi and sometimes berry bacteria likes to hang out with them. All right, so that is an example of a mutualistic relationship. Um, we also have another type of relationship called parasitism. I'm sure you guys have heard of this before, right? And this happens when one species benefits and the other one is harmed, okay? So think about parasites. I'm sure you hear about them all the time. With your dogs or your cats, tapeworms, ringworms, other types of worms like that can be a parasite, right? Where it's benefiting because it's getting the nutrients, but unfortunately your pet is not. Um, and there's a couple of examples of parasitism in nature. One of the ones that we like to point out on our trail is an invasive species um, called old world climbing fern. So let's pause there, invasive species, what is that? That's a species that uh, is not native to this area and came over and then it kind of outcompetes and takes over the area um, and outcompetes the natives and harms the natives, okay? So this old world climbing fern grows on native trees and it actually blocks the sun and the resources from these trees and it can even collapse um, tree islands in the Everglades. So old world climbing fern would be an example in a, of an invasive species and also a parasite to those trees, okay? Now, one of the relationships, symbiotic relationships you might not have heard of is called commensalism. And this occurs when one species benefits um, from the relationship and the other one doesn't gain or lose anything. So it's, it's neutral, nothing happens to it. Um, and an example of commensalism would be a lot of those um, air plants that grow on trees. Um, they benefit because they're up near the sun, they're getting the sunlight, but they're not harming that host plant, that host tree, okay? So a lot of those, what they call epiphytes and um, air plants that kind of hang out up in the tree branches, uh, that's an example of commensalism. Uh, another vocab word I wanted to go over today is competition, okay? Because competition happens in nature all the time. And that's a relationship between two or more living things for resources, things like food, water, shelter, and or space, okay? So there's a lot of competition. And keep this word in mind because when we're doing the activity later, um, you're gonna realize that some of these adaptations that these birds have came along because of competition, okay? And lastly, adaptation. What is an adaptation? Well, an adaptation is any kind of behavior or um, structural change that helps an organism survive and live and reproduce, okay? So it could be a tool, a body part, a skill, or a behavior that helps this organism to live, to survive, and to reproduce, okay? So with that in mind, that leads us to the activity that we're going to do today, okay? So lots of animals, lots of plants have adaptations in nature, right? Fish have gills that helps them breathe underwater. Um, some trees have adaptations, okay? But today we're gonna learn about the birds at the Solid Waste Authority that inhabit our trail system and the adaptations that they have. So if you wanna come over here, we're gonna look at these six different birds today. We have our threatened wood stork, which again is one of the reasons why we have our trail system our hummingbird, our yellow-bellied warbler, we have our black vultures, our snail kite, again, the main reason why we have our trail system, it's an endangered species of bird, and then our roseate spoonbill. So those are the six birds that we're going to uh, be focused on today. And usually what we do is we have a little chart like this, okay? So you put the name of your bird here, and the first thing you would do is actually draw the beak. Okay, so make a drawing of that beak. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with an easy one. I'm going to start with the roseate spoonbill, okay, because I like the shape of its beak. And if I were doing this lesson with you guys, I would go ahead and take a pencil or something and draw the beak, right? So let's draw that beak. That's what that beak looks like to me for the roseate spoonbill, okay? That's kind of the shape of the beak, right? 
So we're gonna draw that beak. And then after we draw the beak, we're gonna match it with the tool that we think that beak is represented by. So let's look at the tools over here. Here's the different tools. Which one do we think represents the rosette spoonbill, which we just drew, okay? Do we think it would be a plastic knife? A hook? A little straw? Tweezers? A kind of colander, like small spoon colander? Or a little dip net? So if we look at this beak real close, and we look at the shape of it, and we think about what it does, we're gonna probably guess that it would be paired with this spoon here, okay? So the Rosette spoon bill has a spoon-shaped bill, right? And that helps it actually capture something in the water, which we'll talk about later. But here, we're gonna match this up. So that goes with that one. All right, back over here, we have some more birds. So let's talk about our snail kite now, right? Our famous snail kite that we love. Um, our snail kite eats apple snails, which I have one in here if you can see it clearly, okay? So its beak is used to eat this apple snail. What do we think is gonna be the tool that helps it do that? If we come over here, again, we have our plastic knife, right? Our hook, our straw, our tweezers, and our dip net. If you guessed hook, you're correct. Look, see how their beak is a hook shape? That's so they can get in and dig out that snail, okay? So that is what would uh, go with the snail kite's beak. Alrighty, let's see, we've got our yellow-bellied warbler, little tiny generalist bird, as we call it, generalist, okay? And so we're gonna look at our tools now. We've got the dip net left, we've got the tweezers, we've got the straw, and we've got the little plastic knife, right? Well, I'm gonna look at this bird's beak. It's kind of small, probably eats seeds or something like that, right? So I'm gonna go with the tweezer. I think that that looks like a tool that the yellow belly warbler would use. All right, then we've got the hummingbird, right? Here's our little hummingbird. We do have native hummingbirds in Florida. And most likely out of the three tools left, right? Dip net, straw, and plastic knife. We're gonna choose that straw, right? Because look at how thin that beak is. Look at how thin it is, and we can probably, you guys can probably guess what this bird eats, which we'll talk about later. So we're going to pair that up right there. All right, wood stork. We have our threatened wood stork, okay? Out of the tool, two tools left, what do we think is most like this bird's beak? Let's look at this. Well, it's in the water. It's kind of got a wider beak. Do we think it's gonna be uh, the plastic knife, serrated, or do we think it's gonna be the dip net? Well, it's in the water, it's bigger. I would probably assume it's the dip net, right? The little net that we have. And then lastly, that leaves our black vultures, okay? Our cleanup crew of the environment. And black vultures, if you look at their beaks, they have a little point. And you can't really see, but they actually have a little bit of a serration too. So we're gonna match up that plastic knife utensil because see the serrations with the black vulture, okay? So there's our pairings here, okay? If you wanna take a look one more time and scan it, just so you can see what's paired with what. And now what we're gonna do is we're going to, based on the bird and based on the shape of its beak and based on the tool that we guessed, we're gonna try to match it with the food. So here I have some little seeds. I have one type of fish. I have a second type of fish. 
I have a nice little flower. I have an apple snail. And I have, unfortunately, a dead carcass of a raccoon, okay? So now we're gonna try to match these up with the birds. So let's look first at our hummingbird. We said our hummingbird has small beak like a straw. So what do we think out of these foods is gonna match up with the hummingbird? Well, ding, 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 it's gonna be a flower, right? They love to drink the nectar out of the flower. So that is the food that's gonna go with the hummingbird. How about the yellow-bellied warbler? We said it had little tweezers, um, which is used to pick up smaller foods. If we look at these foods here, right? Which ones do we think the tweezers are gonna pick up? Let's see. Well, no, that's too big. Not gonna pick up that. We could try, but this isn't very helpful picking up those, right? So we're gonna guess seed, okay? Seeds are what that yellow bellied warbler would eat. Seeds and little nuts and fruits, okay? Again, the warbler is a generalist. All right, now let's move on to our wood stork. Our wood stork has that big dip net, right? So what do we think out of all these foods, what is it gonna eat? Is it gonna eat the apple snail, the carcass, or the fish? Well, if you guessed fish, that is correct. It's gonna eat a large fish, larger than this, okay? But this is what we have. So that would be the food of the wood stork, okay? Let's move on to our black vulture. Vultures, I said they're the cleanup crew, right, of nature. So what are they gonna eat out of the three left? The apple snail, the fish, or the carcass? It's gonna be the carcass, right? They eat dead things, which sounds gross, but they're really awesome because they clean up uh, animals and they help to prevent diseases, honestly. Um, so that's good. All right. So we have our snail kite and our roseate spoonbill. Now, if you were paying attention earlier, you know what that snail kite eats. And that name probably gives you a little bit of a hint, right? It eats apple snails. There's a picture of one and here's a shell of one. Okay, so that's what that snail kite would eat. And last but not least, we have our beautiful roseate spoonbill with that nice little spoon, okay? Acts like a little, um, colander and that would eat smaller fish smaller fish okay so each one of these birds has adapted its beak in order to eat the certain foods that it eats right the snail kite has adapted so that its beak is a hook shape so it can dig into that snail um, and pull it out of the shell okay the wood stork and the roseate spoonbill have adapted to have different shaped beaks to help them get different sized fish um, the hummingbird has adapted a beak that's thin and long so it can get into that flower and get to that nectar, right? So these are all adaptations um, that help these animals survive and reproduce, okay? Um, we have lots of other animals that use our trails as well. We have white-tailed deer, we have alligators, we have bobcats, um, and we have evidence that they're there. This is how we know they're there. Some evidence would be actually seeing them, right? Some evidence would be footprints. Some evidence would be scat or poop left behind. Uh, maybe a feather or something like that. Thank you for tuning in to this recording today and our seventh grade lesson. Um, I just wanted to remind you guys that we will be doing other recordings like this and putting it on our website. So if you guys want to see some of our other lessons, you can go to swa.org backslash education to see our other lessons. Also, right now we're doing virtual programs. So if you tune in on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, we'll be doing Adobe Connects um, live so that you guys can kind of see our virtual tours of our different facilities and whatnot. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we actually do a Facebook live event. Um, and all of those are at 11 a.m. So thank you again for tuning into the recording. I hope you learned something and you had fun, and we'll see you soon, okay? Bye.